my talk today is titled Leaving Connecticut, Shaping America. And like all academics, I put a colon after it in a lot of words. But what I would like you to do is to think of this talk as a prequel to the exhibit to come to a land of milk and honey, which opens three weeks and four days from today, right here. Um, it's an exhibit that literally, as, as, uh, as you've heard, that has been years in the making. And Kathy, Alex, Linda, Kate, Sean, a host of consultants, both uh, in Connecticut and in Ohio, have been working tirelessly and enthusiastically on this exhibit. And I do hope you will mark your calendars, not only to come to the exhibit, but to come many times and bring your friends, your neighbors, family, everyone with you. Personally, I can't wait to see it. And I am so excited to have a chance to kind of get the ball rolling with this story, which is about the story before the story. Not too long ago, I spent an uncomfortable evening reading our state's first ever economic strategic plan, <laughs> a 541 page analysis of Connecticut's economy and what needs to be done to assure that we have a healthy economic future. Among the most troubling of its findings was the following. Since 2000, Connecticut has lost a higher percentage of its 25 to 34 year old population than any other state in the nation. The plan left no doubt as to how serious a problem this loss of young adults to other places is. Connecticut is at a crossroads, it said. The workforce is aging as talented young workers are leaving the state and population and job growth are stagnating. One of Connecticut's first priorities moving forward, the report indicated, must be creating an economic climate in which our children can not only afford to live in Connecticut, but in which they can prosper. Now, as sobering as the governor's report was, we can perhaps draw some solace from the fact that this isn't the first time in which Connecticut has faced a crisis over the loss of its young people to other more hopeful places. Little over 200 years ago, in May of 1817, Connecticut Governor Oliver Wolcott issued a remarkably similar note of concern in his gubernatorial report to the state's General Assembly. An investigation into the causes which produced the numerous emigrations of our industrious and enterprising young men is by far the most important subject which can engage our attention. Connecticut in 1817, as in 2023, was hemorrhaging its young people, the lifeblood of its future, to other more economically attractive locations. And it had been doing so for a long time. On January 1st of 1801, on the first day of the 19th century, the newly chartered Connecticut Academy of Arts and Sciences in its first project as an organization had sent a circular letter to each of Connecticut's then 107 towns, asking them to provide detailed answers to 113 questions about their town. One of the items of a prime interest to the Academy was the migrations, emigrations from the town or society. In their responses, most towns left no doubt that out-migration had been a real problem of significant duration. The towns of Haddam and Killingsworth, for example, both reported that emigrations from this town have been very numerous. Coventry said, there have been many emigrations from this town to the new countries, so that of late, the number of inhabitants has not greatly increased. Farmington, with a population of 2,809 people in the 1800 census, reported that 147 families and 40 or more young unmarried persons of both sexes had left the town for a total loss of 775 people, almost a quarter of the town's population. Durham explained that the reason that there's been no more increase of population for many years is that individuals and families have removed 
almost perpetually to other places. Lebanon reported almost wistfully on the number of inhabitants it had lost. And try to follow this. This one's a tongue twister. <clears throat> Emigration for more than 30 years has been so constant that it is judged that if all who left the town who are still living and their descendants and descendants of those who are dead were to return, they would triple the number of inhabitants. <laughs> Twisted math, but uh, <laughs> an important statistics. Clearly, Governor Wolcott's 1818 message calling out migration, the most important subject which can engage our attention was addressing a real and serious problem. Where we might ask were all those people going? Where did the grass look that much greener? Well, although they dispersed to sites both far and near, one area in particular proved a powerful magnet for Connecticut expatriates. This was the part of Northeast Ohio, stretching 120 miles west from the Pennsylvania border and from the 41st degree of latitude to 42 degrees in two minutes, a place many people called New Connecticut, but which was also known and today is still known as Connecticut's Western Reserve. This was the part of its original charter lands that Connecticut reserved ownership of when it ceded the remainder of its lands to the newly formed United States in 1786. The deal which Alexander Hamilton cooked up was this, the federal government assumes all the debt from the Revolutionary War, you give up your excess lands. So Connecticut, I love those Yankee traders, they said, okay, you can have all our lands, but wait, there's more. We want to keep a little bit here for our Revolutionary War veterans and a little more for the people who were burned out. So that's how we got the Western Reserve. Now, have any of you ever been to the Western Reserve, the Northeastern part of Ohio? If you have been, then you can attest to the fact that in so many ways, that region seems to be in town layout, naming patterns and architecture, virtually a mirror image of Connecticut, isn't it? From Clarendon, from Clarendon, I appear to be frozen. There you go. Wow, where'd we go? Well, we'll see what happens. From Clarendon, that Ohio land of steady habits, to Hudson, Stowe to Strongsville, the area roughly between Youngstown and Cleveland appears to be nothing less than Connecticut West. But is it appearances, especially in a post-colonial revival America, can be and often are deceiving? I have for a long time been curious about the degree to which the first settlers of the Western Reserve transplanted Connecticut's distinctive culture, institutions, and values to their new homeland. Why, I wondered, did people decide to leave Connecticut? What were the push factors driving them out and the pull factors drawing them to the Western Reserve instead of other possible places? What was the experience of removal like? Who went? How did they travel? How long and how hard was their journey? And how did the people of Connecticut who stayed feel about the emigration of so many of their children? These are questions that could, and I certainly think it's high time that there be a new major book on this topic. But today, let me just share with you some of the things that I've found so far. What made so many people from the nutmeg state decide to uproot themselves and head uh, and take their families and head west. Generally, it was the same two factors that have propelled much of human mobility in all times and places, the rhyming twins of need and greed. By 1750, much of Connecticut arable land east of the Great River, that's the Connecticut River, had been farmed out. Many fields that had once been astonishingly productive were now only as good as fallow periods and limited manure could make them. In addition, everywhere one looked, they saw confirmation that New England's lifestyle had had wonderful effects on old English bodies. Not only had the descendants of the Puritan first comers lived long and healthful lives, 
They had, they had obeyed that biblical injunction to be fruitful and multiply with relish. English immigrants who settled in Connecticut lived uh, twice as long as those who had come from Virginia. They lived a decade longer than those they left behind in England. Infant mortality rates were low, marriages early, and childbearing years long. The result was a population explosion that left Connecticut fathers scrambling to find sufficient arable land to pass on to many children. Between 1730 and 1760, in a manner that would have made Thomas Malthus smile, Connecticut's population more than tripled from 38,000 in 1730 to 70,000 in 1749 to over 130,000 by 1760. And on the eve of the American Revolution in 1774, it was close to 200,000 people. Town populations began to badly outstrip agricultural capacity. The abundant 150 acres of land given to the average first comer was soon whittled down by partible inheritance to just enough land to get by, and then not even that. In the 1730s, the demand for more land was satisfied by the sale of 300,000 acres in the Northwest Connecticut Hills, right where we are. But by 1750, the last of the colony's public lands were gone. Meanwhile, in the land of steady habits, no habit was steadier than regularly producing children. So the need for additional farmland for rising generations became a Connecticut constant. For a time, this need was partially met, or at least was intended to be met, by the sale of lands claimed by the newly formed Susquehanna Land Company uh, along the fertile valleys of the Susquehanna River within the bounds of Connecticut's 1662 uh, charter, a huge area that the developers creatively called Westmore Land. And you can still go to Pennsylvania and see Westmoreland County. <laughs> the problem was that the land claimed by Connecticut was also claimed by Pennsylvania. This led to a generation of intercolonial conflict, sometimes incredibly violent, that was ultimately decided in favor of the Keystone State. Land hungry Connecticans, especially those who'd served in the expeditions against Canada during the French and Indian War, also were attracted to the Northern Connecticut River Valley. Up the valley, these land hungry migrants came, bringing their families, possessions, and Connecticut towns with them to places like Wyndham, Orange, and Essex counties to create a new. Pomfret, Guilford, Hartford, Wallingford, Brookfield, Norwich, Middlebury, Salisbury, Goshen, Bethel, and the list goes on and on. This desire to carry old Connecticut to new lands was so strong that 25 of the 211 Vermont town names appearing in America's first census, about one out of every eight towns, was named after a Connecticut town of origin. Now, knowing that, it's not surprising that when the people of Vermont uh, assembled to declare themselves on January 15th, 1777, to be a free and independent jurisdiction or state, they declared that they were forever hereafter to be called, known, and distinguished by the name of New Connecticut, <laughs> alias Vermont alias Vermont stuck, go figure. <laughs> For most migrants, Vermont soon proved to be too hilly, rocky, and way too cold. And in the years after the American Revolution, many looked to the lands in Western New York State, promoted by speculators such as Oliver Phelps, uh, there you go, Oliver Phelps in this picture, who in 1787 contracted to buy over 6 million acres in New York's Genesee County for resale to New England out migrants from his land office in Suffield. These lands were indeed attractive, but the biggest plum in the West for land speculators, 
would-be settlers, and the people of Connecticut collectively were the 5,000 square miles of territory included in the Western Reserve. Adventuring in lands and in procuring inhabitants to settle them was then, as the Connecticut diplomat and profiteer Silas Dean noted, the best branch of business in America. And the agreement Connecticut made with the United States carving out the Western Reserve from the rest of the Northwest Territory prompted a decade long debate over how the reserve land should be sold, who should be doing the selling and what should be done with the proceeds. The debate just went on and on and on, uh, no doubt in part because during that decade, the Ohio country was the scene of many of the most deadly battles between Indians and whites in American history. Mad Anthony Wayne's decisive victory at the Battle of Fallen Timbers near present day Toledo in 1794, followed by the Treaty of Greenville the following year, cleared the reserve effectively for white settlement. Simultaneously, the Jay Treaty with England meant the British too would vacate the Northwest. Not surprisingly, agreement on how to dispose of the Western Reserve lands was reached the same year the Jay Treaty was signed. And suddenly it was safe to go there, we can work out our difficulties. The reserve was sold in the fall of 1795 for $1,200,000 in notes. They took notes for the land sales. To the Connecticut Land Company, a syndicate of venture capitalists whose names read to some extent like a who's who of Connecticut's venerable standing order. Edwards, Bull, Griswold, Root, Stoddard, Holbrook, Lyman, Morgan, families whose members had been part of the ruling oligarchy of Connecticut for generations, and let's include Boardman in the list, were thoroughly salted among the names of the newly wealthy. The biggest investor was Oliver Phelps of Suffield, uh, already heavily invested in the Genesee country, who signed on for 168,000 of the debt. The smallest investor, Sylvanus Griswold, put himself on the hook for only one one hundredth of that amount. A 50 person surveying team led by Moses Cleveland of Canterbury was sent out the following spring. And in 1796 and 1797, the Western Reserve was mapped, staked, and made ready for sale. The surveying method Cleveland's party used both copied and departed from that used by the surveyors of the United States Northwest Territory, from which the Western Reserve had been carved out. The grid system employed in the Northwest Territory was used dividing up the landscape into uniform rectangular lots of equal size. Townships that were six miles square subdivided into sections that were one square mile each. That's how the Northwest Territory was laid out. The Connecticut Land Company laid out townships that were only five miles square, also subdivided into sections of one square mile. The Connecticut land speculators, unlike the United States government, did not specifically reserve one section in each township for support of public schools. And the irony of this, of course, is that when the state of Connecticut sold the land, it dedicated all proceeds from the sale to support public education, but only here in Connecticut. One can't overstate or overestimate the importance of the grid system in the history of westward expansion. Laying out distant and unknown lands into packages of the same size and shape turned an irregular and unknown landscape into a standardized commodity that could be bought and sold at standardized prices, located with specificity on a map, and easily exchanged for other parcels of land of the same size and shape by people who had never actually laid eyes on it. The Western Reserve surveyors began in the southeast corner of, re of the reserve, and they numbered the townships south to north in sequence until they came to Lake Erie. Each vertical strip of townships was called a range. Ranges were numbered from east to west. Thus, a prospective purchaser sitting in Lyme or Bloomfield could look at the map and see 
that the land he was being offered in Ohio in range three, section 13, was adjacent to both Lake Erie and the Ashtabula River, while range 12, section six, was along the Cuyahoga River, just south of the proposed town of Cleveland. The language of range and township became the lingua franca of westward expansion, and letters to and from the reserve are loaded with discussions of the qualities of various places to settle, all described in reference to the grid system. To assure that each investor got a proportionate share of the reserve's better and lesser quality lands, the Connecticut Land Company distributed the surveyed land through a cumbersome lottery system, which resulted in all the proprietors getting land holdings scattered throughout the reserve. An unint unintended consequence of this mode of distribution was that the subsequent sale of these randomly drawn parcels of land to settlers produced a settlement pattern in Northern Ohio significantly different than the one through which Connecticut itself had been settled. Whereas the most common form of settlement in old Connecticut had been clustered settlement by congregations in new towns, which later grew and then spread out by hiving off daughter towns, settlement in the Western Reserve was from the beginning to be much more individualized and broadly dispersed. Land was usually purchased not by congregations, but by individuals who chose to lo their location based on what they could find out about specific parcels being offered and what they could afford. For many years, the cabin in the clearing, not the inviting village, was the most common site in New Connecticut. In any event, even as the Connecticut Reserve was being made ready for sale, a kind of westward fever had gripped the east. People were on the move and their direction was toward the setting sun. In early March of 1795, the Connecticut Journal ran a story from Albany, New York, indicating that upwards of 1,200 slaves loaded with women, children, and furniture coming from the east had passed through this city within three days. The current of emigration, it noted, flows incessantly through this city. Two months later, the Norwich Packet ran a story from Whitestown, New York, which reported that land speculators are everywhere to be found and the number of honest husbandmen who are moving westward exceed all calculation. The story estimated that 15 or 20 boats a day filled with families moving westward passed by Old Fort Schuyler near Lake Oneida. The West, it asserted confidently, will shortly become as populous as the Connecticut High. What was it that drove so many people to leave Connecticut at the beginning of the American era? Certainly, the opportunity to trade a limited parcel of worn out land for a much larger tract of fertile and virgin soil was primary. One astute observer in 1717 noted the similarities between the Western migrants and the semi-sedentary indigenous groups who had once roamed the land. Americans, he said, partake in no small degree of the habits of their predecessors, the Aborigines, who, when they have exhausted one hunting ground, pull up stakes and incontinently march off to another, four or 500 miles off where game is plentiful. So with honest brother Jonathan, when he's eaten up everything around him and worked his land to skin and bone, and when his house is just on the point of tumbling about his ears, instead of taking the trouble of restoring the one or rebuilding the other, he abandons both and packing up his movables consisting of his wife and chubby boys in a wagon, whistles himself to the banks of the Ohio. But desire for land is only part of the story. One who reads the many accounts of this epic diaspora carefully soon finds a host of other reasons pushing migrants out of Connecticut, even as promoters' enthusiastic accounts drew them westward. These additional factors, which built in intensity throughout the early decades of the 19th century, undoubtedly help explain why the stream of emigrants to the Western Reserve became a literal torrent after 1815. 
To begin with, Connecticut in the early 19th century faced an environmental crisis on several fronts. Our age, concerned as it is with global warming, has almost forgotten that early America was held in the grip of a period of intense cold known as the Little Ice Age. This severe cooling of the Earth's temperature, which lasted roughly from 1450 to 1850, had internal cycles of warmer and colder weather, and the decade from 1810 to 1820 proved to be the coldest period ever recorded in North America. Growing seasons were shortened by several weeks, and Connecticuts were required to heat their homes eight months out of 12. To make matters worse, in 1815, the biggest volcanic eruption ever recorded took place on Mount Tambora in the Indonesian archipelago. The 400 million tons of gas released by the volcano shrouded the earth in vapor, producing in 1816 what is still called the year without a summer. In New England, snow fell during every month of that year. Crops failed and firewood the victim of a major tree felling hurricane that blasted through New England in 1815 was in critically short supply. The climatic crisis created an economic crisis for marginal farmers, many of whom just threw in the towel in the east and joined the hopeful heading west. Some people had political reasons for leaving New England. A writer in the Worcester Spy noted that in addition to the sterility of our soil and the coldness of our climate, some people were emigrating because of the overbearing oppression of the predominant party, a party who would not employ or buy of a Republican if they could possibly obtain the same of a Federalist. Has a Republican an equal chance for the Federalist in this region, in commerce, at the bar, in physic, in divinity or in any other profession, whatever, we know they have not. Feels familiar, doesn't it? Others echoed the criticism, pointing out that Connecticut's Federalist Standing Order, the elite subject to perpetual reelection, largely on the strength of their old and venerated family names, had used the bankruptcy and imprisonment laws to enrich themselves at the expense of the state's Republicans calling the laws allowing for seizure of debtors' property weapons in the hands of your party to assist them in perpetuating their own power and to oppress political opponents, a Republican writer for the Hartford Times claimed that for many Republicans, emigration or imprisonment, <clears throat> emigration or imprisonment seems to be the only alternative. Federalist policy has driven Republicans to this dreadful situation, they must leave that party or this state. Such criticism of Connecticut as a state whose government was so hostile to political opponents that it sent them into exile raises the interesting possibility that the Western Reserve, rather than being a place to which Connecticut's political culture was transplanted, was rather its antithesis a Republican stronghold espousing anti-federalist political and print, uh, principles. This is something I really look forward to investigating as I continue my work on the Western Reserve. Now, other motivations discussed as causes uh, of out-migration from Connecticut include religious intolerance. Connecticut forced its citizens to support the established Congregational Church but with their taxes until 1818. Another reason is inequitable taxation. Connecticut laws tax farm families as much as 70% more than those who worked in other employments. So then as now, the state's tax burden was a factor driving some people to remove. So let's review the bidding. A shortage of land and that land exhausted. A multi-stranded environmental crisis. Political repression that spilled over into economic and social life religious intolerance and inequitable taxation. All of these appear to have been factors behind the thousands of individual decisions made by Connecticuts in the early 1800s to pick up stakes and head west. But who went and how, having made the decision to go to the Western Reserve, 
did they get there? I have at this point in my research, two images of Connecticut's out migrants, one that's a bit too close up and another that's a bit too distant. The too close image comes from the numerous diaries, journals, and travel narratives recorded by various individuals who made the trek west and lived to write about it. These indispensable accounts by people such as the surveyor Seth Pease, missionary Joseph Badger and Thomas Robbins, the physician Zira Hawley, the English traveler D. Griffith, and the young woman in search of a husband, Margaret Van Horn Dwight, my favorite, give us much of the indispensable detail of the journey to and conditions in the early Western Reserve. But as good as these accounts are, and Margaret Dwight's in particular is a classic travel narrative, it's a wonderful read. There are also idiosyncratic records of one person's observation, one sojourner's interpretation of their own unique experience. So that's the too close view. The too far image is the collective view of the effects of migration as revealed by the historical census data. That focus is also hazy, but it gives us a sense of some characteristics common to the migrants as a group. The census data, census data tells us that the population of New Connecticut, as the reserve was also known, was different in significant but important ways from <laughs> old Connecticut. Not surprisingly, given the effort it took to literally begin the world anew in a wilderness, people in Ohio were much younger than back home. Old Connecticut was then, as it is today, a graying population. More than one of every six people in Connecticut was 45 years or older, in a time when only one out of three could expect to reach their 60th birthday. On the Western Reserve, the number of adults over 45 was fewer than one in 10. Also, unlike old Connecticut, where women slightly outnumbered men throughout the period of migration, the Western Reserve population was strongly skewed toward males by a ratio of 54% to 46%. In politics, that statistic would be called a landslide. For a lot of men in the Western Reserve, it was called a long, cold, lonely winter. <laughs> Seeing this condition, the travel writer John Mellish urged emigrating New Englanders to take a greater portion of the blooming Yankee girls along with them and not suffer nearly 17,000 of them to pine away as old maids in their own country when it's seen they are so much wanted in this. <laughs> Love him. Another important but predictable finding of the census data is that while Connecticut's population was relatively stable, the Western Reserve was simply booming. It experienced a 236% population increase in one decade between 1810 and 1820. Now, it would be great to be able to chart that growth year by year, but the data isn't there. It, uh, but it, it certainly is striking. Now, if the census data gives us an insight into how Connecticut's Western Reserve was taking shape demographically, the journals and diaries give us a view of what the experience of removal and resettlement was like. While each account is personal, some observation seems appropriate to all of them. To begin with, the journey west was both long and hard, between 500 and 650 miles, depending on the route selected and destination. Road conditions ranged from very bad to truly deplorable for most of the journey. In heavy rains, roads became in mud pits and streams impassable. In some wetland areas, efforts were made to ameliorate the muddiness by building corduroy roads of logs placed perpendicular to the direction of travel, which as you can imagine, provided their own kind of hellish discomfort. The generally awful state of the heavily traveled routes may help explain why so many people preferred to pull their goods westward on sleds during the winter snowpack. The would-be emigrant had choice of two possible routes to the reserve. Uh, geographer Bill Keegan, using the accounts of several early migrants, has created a map, this map, that shows travelers' options. A northern route went up the Mohawk Valley and crossed New York to Buffalo. 
there, a choice had to be made between travel by boat along Lake Erie's southern shore or to continue to follow the rugged trail on land along the shoreline. The southern route crossed Pennsylvania along the old Forbes Road that was cut through the Pennsylvania mountains during the French and Indian War. It crossed the mountains into Pittsburgh and then followed trails into the reserve at Youngstown. Neither route was a cakewalk and neither offered significant advantages over the other in time or distance. Although there was significant variation in the duration of individual journeys, travelers seemed to have averaged about 12 to 15 miles a day, less when crossing mountains, more when the weather was good and the terrain flat and dry. Six weeks seems to be the average journey, though as transportation improvements such as canals and better roads came into play near the end of the period, travel time to the reserve uh, seems to have greatly decreased. A determined Zira Hawley made the journey from Connecticut to Ohio in only 23 days in 1820. The Reverend Joseph Badger, who would stop and badger anyone, even trees with his preaching uh, along the way west, he took over four months, but he converted a lot of wildlife. So no matter how long the journey took, it was an experience no traveler would ever forget. In addition to the not inconsiderable physical dangers of traveling bad roads, fording swelled streams and rivers, and climbing and descending high mountain passes, migrants experienced inhospitable treatment at overcrowded and often squalid inns and taverns. They slept fitfully among strangers, ate bad food with rowdy, drunken, and sometimes dangerous fellow travelers, and they fought off both homesickness and fear of the unknown. Henry Levitt Ellsworth, son of the Supreme Court Justice and framer of the Constitution, Oliver Ellsworth, sought to procure for himself some instruments of death prior to leaving Connecticut to protect himself from the rare but not unknown incidents of highway robbery. For many of the Connecticut migrants who'd lived their entire lives among the remarkably, almost incredibly homogeneous and undiverse population of the Nutmeg State in 1800, the journey west produced their first exposure to groups of people who were different in language, culture, and values than they were. Many found such contact disconcerting, and some found it, frankly, offensive and frightening. Consider, for example, the prim and proper Margaret Van Horn Dwight's description of the Germans she encountered violating Connecticut's time-honored conventions for Sunday deportment at an inn in Hanover, Pennsylvania in 1810. I should not have thought it possible to pass a Sabbath in our country among such a dissolute, vicious set of wretches as we are now among. I believe at least 50 Deutschmen have been here today to smoke, drink, swear, pitch sense, almost dance, laugh, and talk Deutsch and stare at us. They come in in droves, young and old, black and white, women and children. It's dreadful to see so many people that you cannot speak to or understand. <laughs> but if the road west brought migrants significant exposure to things previously unknown, it's also clear that they were never far removed from some connection to the state from which they had left. For all along the way, in town after little town, many of which are now all but forgotten, migrants reported encountering persons they had known in or who came from Connecticut, but who now resided in this or that way station on the slow Western journey. The roads to the Western Reserve, particularly the Northern route, was studded with Connecticut's who, like themselves, had chosen to seek their fortunes in the West just not as far as the Western Reserve. Were these people who had started out for Ohio and found other possibilities along the way? Had they found the road west, a road too far, or maybe just decided the opportunities were better closer to their original home? Maybe time and research will make this a bit clearer. But for now, 
All we can say is that tens of thousands of, of Connecticut natives who started out for New Connecticut in the early 1800s found thousands of fellow former nutmeggers along the way with whom they shared the important bond of common origins. How did all these migrants feel about pulling up roots and leaving their natal state? Some undoubtedly felt a pioneer's excitement at facing a world that was all possibility. Others, maybe the younger sons, uh, not in line to inherit the Connecticut family farm, seethed with resentment about being forced into exile. And some, it is clear, saw having to leave Connecticut for the West as a sign of shame, a visible symbol that they were the expendable ones. How else can we explain Margaret Dwight's comment on day two of her journey? The country we pass through till we are beyond New York, I need not describe to you, nor indeed could I, for I am attended by a very unpleasant, though not uncommon companion, one to whom I have bowed in subjection ever since I left you, pride. It has entirely prevented me seeing the country, lest I should be known. And so I suppose it will attend me to the mountains, then I am sure it will bid me adieu. Hiding in the wagon so she wouldn't be recognized. This is an aspect of outmigration that we rarely see or even think about, but it certainly complicates all those jingoistic views of Anglos hot in the pursuit of manifest destiny. Surely, Connecticut's left their state with mixed emotions. But how did those who stayed behind feel about their leaving? In most cases, Connecticut's, at least those not involved in promoting the sale of the Western lands, viewed the outmigration with grave concern. One observer lamented that Connecticut's population had been kept down and attributed it to the fact that migration from Connecticut must have rateably exceeded the migration from any of the other states. The effect of the 50,000 New Englanders who have for a number of years passed annually over the Alleghenies led another writer to bemoan the severe decline of New England's political clout in favor of the new states. Other Connecticut's saw the outmigration as producing not just a youth drain, but a serious capital outflow as well. The property that is carried out by this constant stream of migration, wrote one, cannot be much, if any, less than a million dollars yearly, which waste is not repaired. Worse than the loss of capital was the outmigrant's potential loss of humanity. More than a few critics hearken back to the old Puritan fears of Creolian degeneracy, the likely possibility that settlers living in a wilderness envir environment would lose their civilized qualities and return to a savage state of nature. The transition from civilization to savageness is much easier than from the latter to the former, warned a Hartford current commentator. He warned of a population of millions of our own color, flesh and blood, who lived without schools, without a ministry, without religious institutes, without the Sabbath, without Bibles, sunk and still sinking into the depths of moral <laughs> debasement. Another writer who styled himself only a Connecticut farmer urged those thinking of leaving to reconsider before it was too late. Few, very few, I believe, of those who have sold the inheritance of their fathers to improve their fortunes in the Western wilds have fully counted the cost of their undertaking. For myself, I love my native land. I reverence her laws, her religion, her morals, and her habits, and would not exchange them for the silver in the mines of Peru. Well, I love my state too. And like the man who called himself Connecticut farmer in 1818, I truly lament the loss of our state's young people, your and my children and grandchildren to uh, all those other places, just as he lamented those thousands who went on the road in the early 1800s. 
And I feel a little badly about leaving all those out migrants and you as this audience, mostly in transit to the Western Reserve. Like you, at least I hope like you, I've got many questions about what happened to these people when they got to Ohio and how their effort to make their lives anew progressed. Did they ultimately create a new Connecticut in the Western Reserve or did the Western Reserve create them anew? That and many other questions relevant to our day and time are, are gonna be answered or at least begun to be answered in to come to a land of milk and honey which opens right here 26 days from now. And I hope like me, you'll come back to hear more of this story from Connecticut and America's past. And here's the bonus, uh, because I want you to come back, I wanna plant an earworm now that on April 21st is gonna trigger a reaction in your mind saying, I must go to Litchfield <laughs> Historical Society. So what I'm gonna ask you to do I'm going back to my old days as a songwriter. <clears throat> Many years ago, I wrote a song about going to the Western Reserve. And it is now almost as old as I am, but I have resurrected it <laughs> for this day. And <clears throat> it's easy to learn and it's easy to sing. And Jerry, you have a band, right? You're a banjo player? There's somebody is a banjo. There, there you are, yes. Okay, so you're gonna lead the front row. <laughs> it's easy and it's fun. And it kind of expresses that optimism that people had to feel when, you know, the, the wagon slowed it up, you said goodbye, it's time to go. And uh, let's, let's put, if you're sad, you say, let's put lipstick on the pig. If you're happy, you say, let's get going. And here's what you might say. We're gonna do it slowly, then we're gonna do it together. Then I'm off to the races and you're doing the choruses. <laughs> oh, we're off to the Ohio, where the air is fresh and warm. And instead of digging crops of rocks, we'll be planting golden corn. Pretty easy, right? You're with me. Oh, we're off to the Ohio, where the air is fresh and warm. And instead of digging crops of rocks, we'll be planting golden corn. That was really good. If you do it like that all the way through, there is probably a record contract. <laughs> oh, we're off to the Ohio, where the air is fresh and warm. Instead of digging the crops of rocks, we'll be planting golden corn. Oh, I fought with his rail cut up, fought right by his side. We won the war, and my reward, see Ohio for my bride. Oh, we're off to the Ohio, where the air is fresh and warm. And instead of digging the crops of rocks, we'll be planting golden corn. And it's goodbye, Parson Beecher. Goodbye, Boardman, too. And if all works out, I have no doubt I will be a squire like you. Oh, we're off to the Ohio, where the air is fresh and warm. And instead of digging crops of rocks, we'll be planting gold and corn. Once more, we are off to the Ohio, where the air is fresh and warm. And instead of digging crops of rocks, we'll be planting gold and corn. Instead of digging crops of rocks, we'll be planting golden corn. I realize, I, I realize that I owe all you Zoom people an apology or else I just want to let you know you dodged a bullet. But <laughs> anyway, thank you for listening through that. Thank you all for coming. This has been wonderful to have you here. And I can't wait for this exhibit. Please do come. Please bring your friends. This is a big deal. So thanks again.
Oh, absolutely. Uh, but let me let me get over here so Zoom folks can uh, see. I will tell you, I have just conveyed to you everything I know about the Western Reserve and out migration. So the answer to every question you ask me now is going to be made up. But let's go. <laughs> yes. Uh, the Well, my guess, and I should know this because I used to live there, is the Ohio River, and it probably was the name of a native tribe or a name that the natives gave to the river. <coughs> but, you know, kind of like the Connecticut <coughs> comes from the Connecticut River. Yes. Was the uh, decades 1810 to 1820 the peak of migration to Ohio? And if so, why did it decline? Well, no, it was when the floodgates opened, and it really... It, you know, what happens is that migration westward is triggered really in 1810. Connecticut, in 1818, we got the new constitution. That overturned the standing order and a lot of the problems that people, a lot of the political problems and religious problems that were driving people away were somewhat ameliorated. So it, it tamped down out migration to some extent but what you find in the letters from Connecticut is that once people are moving to Ohio, it just continues. It goes all the way out to Oregon by 1830. Some of the, some of the most moving letters I have ever read are from a group of sisters from Middlefield, Connecticut, who over, over their lifetime, their families move west, first to New York, then to Ohio, then to Illinois. And you can see these, these women in the letters that they write to each other, trying kind of desperately to keep those family bonds working through words. I, I Sometime I think I'd like to do a talk about that because it really speaks to, you, you can feel this sense of people feeling the bonds of their family connections being just stretched to the limit and this refusal to give it up. Once people start west, they keep going all the way to California, all the way to Oregon. It goes on you know, into the late 19th century. Um, but, but the Ohio to the Western Reserve, I think the 18 teens and 20s are the peak out migration, but it, it, still, it still continues. Could you make sure you repeat the question? I'm so screen? sorry. <laughs> Say again. I have questions for the Zoom audience. Okay, thank you. And Zoom people, I now I owe you a second apology because I'm not telling you what the questions are. And that's you know, for a person who is supposed to have done this and I taught Zoom classes for a year, that's just I get an F. So but I'm gonna try to redeem myself now. Uh, let's take a Zoom question. Sure. So Ann Burke asks, uh, was the Western Reserve governed by the Connecticut government in the early years? No. No, the, it was clear from the, Ohio was made a state in, I think, 1803, 18, 1803, is that right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so they, there is an understanding that the political control of the state is its own, you know, it's going to be an, it's going to be an American territory, then an American state, but this firm commitment to transplant New England culture and values is it's drive from, from the standpoint of the people selling the land and the people in control of government, politics, and religion in Connecticut, it is incredibly important that they put their imprint on the Western Reserve. So one of the most important educational institutions in Ohio and in the Midwest is uh, Case Western Reserve University, which was started by, I believe, the Congregational Church as a, as a mission school, the Western Reserve Academy. There's a lot of that going on. There are the Congregational Church is funding missionaries to the West on a regular basis. They're, they're, that's why this idea of what happens to New England culture in this new setting is really interesting. It, it fascinates me, probably because I lived in Ohio and I see so many vestiges of Connecticut that seem so similar. And yet in some ways, Connecticut, Ohio is very different. So 
so for me, that's an unanswered question. But yes. What happened to the land that they left? If all these people went, what happened to Connecticut and where they lived? The well, the land, the land continued to decline. I, I mean, I. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> F minus. Uh, <laughs> the question was, what happened to the land that the out migration, the out migrants left? My assumption is they sold it for a pittance and it probably languished, you know, at by 1820 or so, Connecticut was largely deforested. I mean, you wouldn't believe it today to look at it today. Yes. There, so, so the land with a, the land there you go. Thank, thank you so much. Yeah, so that's what we'll take your used up old land here and we'll give you this wonderful land in Ohio. You just got to go get there and make it work. So, yes. Uh, did the migrants from Connecticut to the Western Reserve bring the New England town meeting form of government? With them, and uh, is it still in place today? As it is here. You know, the, I had a slide. I, it, it's hard to tell because what the question is <laughs> D plus F, F with hope. Uh, the question is did they take, did the out migrants take the New England town meeting form with them? Uh, in some places, certainly. There is a town, I love this little town called Clarendon. It's, it's not even a suburb of Cleveland. It's just a little village sort of outside of Cleveland. But when you go to Clarendon, it's got a church in it that looks just like a New England congregational church. It's got a town hall that looks just like a New England town hall. And when you go into the town hall to go to the town clerk's office, there's a sign over the door that says Clarendon the land of steady habits. So, <laughs> so it, it, the assumption is that where there was, where there were enough settlers from Connecticut, my, this is hunch for me. It's not, this isn't a, uh, this isn't a knowledgeable answer, but it's a mildly informed answer. Where there were enough people to determine the outcome, they would use the system of government that they had used, especially in these early places. But in a lot of these places you have, because the way the land is being sold in packets, you're getting mixtures of people. And that's what fascinates me, who's calling the shots? And it's a great question. Let, let me get one more from, from Zoom people and I'll... Uh, you talk a lot about uh, you know, all this out migration from Connecticut. So Peter Reynolds asked, has there been any period when migration into Connecticut was a positive trend? Peter Reynolds is asking, has there been a period when in migration into Connecticut was a positive trend? You betcha. <laughs> um, I, let, me, let me say in hind, now, let me hasten to say that the Connecticut's at the time may not have felt like that. I would say, the period, say, from 1835 to 1850, when large numbers of Irish immigrants came in and dug the canals and built the railroad tracks and did all those bike trails that we all enjoy so much, <laughs> that, that that was a very good time for Connecticut in the sense that it helped the industrial and the transportation revolutions that they made possible happen. Connecticut's at the time, especially the standing order, were quite disturbed at this influx of migrants because these are people who aren't like us. Second time is from 1880 to 1920, when the second industrial revolution is going on in Connecticut, we are the third, we're the third smallest state. We are the 10th largest manufacturing state in the union. And it could not have happened without the millions of immigrants from Eastern and Southern Europe and Northern Europe and elsewhere who came to this state to do, you know, to run the factories and do the work. That was a time when the old Yankees realized 
that we need these people and people like the Cheney Mills in Manchester actually sent recruiters to Europe with brochures written in the languages of the people they were trying to attract, promoting them to come work in Connecticut factories. So there have been very positive times, um, but that doesn't mean that everyone always thought it was the best thing for Connecticut. So. Yeah, uh, let me get your question. The towns in the Western Reserve that have the same names? As, uh, Absolutely. And if they don't have the same names as, uh, as Connecticut towns, and there are, there, there are, if you hadn't asked it, I could probably rattle off several, but there are several towns named after Connecticut people who went back, Boardman, Ohio, Trumbull, Ohio, Strongsville, Ohio, um, Norwalk, Ohio. Canfield. Canfield, Ohio. If, if somebody wants to go get a map of Ohio, we'll probably decide it should be called alias Vermont. <laughs> oh, and excuse me, the question was, <clears throat> what is the matter with this guy? The question was, are there Ohio, uh, are there Ohio towns that have Connecticut names? And if any, any of you Zoom people are in Ohio and can think of Ohio towns with Connecticut names, please uh, to, uh, put it in the chat room to Sean so he can inform us, that would be great. Thank you. Yeah, you don't even have to be in Ohio if you just know of something. <laughs> yes. Did you come across any records of people who left Ohio after they had won to come back to Connecticut? Oh, that, yeah. Was, there, was yeah. that a, a pretty... Yeah, oh, you know, it's sure. I mean, yeah. people go, it works out for some, it doesn't work out for others. Some return. One was one of the interesting, one of the really interesting characters to me is, is Henry Levitt Ellsworth, who was the son of Oliver Ellsworth. So he is, you know, he's just pure Yankee. He goes out to the West, he comes back. He gets a job as the first commissioner of patents for the United States government. And he tries to help old college classmates who are fellow Connecticut's. So he helps Sam Colt get his first patent. And then he gets his other Yale classmate, Samuel Morris. He's the one who fights for him to get a patent on the telegraph and to get congressional funding. Then he turns around after being a big Connecticut booster for most of his life, moves out to Indiana and spends the rest of his life there. So there's, you know, there, it goes every direction you can think of. Once you get railroads, even more than steamboats rail, or canals, railroads make a huge difference because when you get the railroad, travel is not, an, it's not a multi-week ordeal anymore. You can go to Ohio in two or three days. You can come back. So once transportation across the continent becomes possible, the whole idea of mobility changes. It's a good question and I apologize again. Kathy, come over here and slap my hand if I don't. <laughs> Any more questions? Yes. Um, was the migration solely for people that are residents of Connecticut or could people from Massachusetts? Uh, there, it's a... The question is, was it just what? Thank you, Kathy. Was it just Connecticut's who out who migrated? And the answer is no. They're they're leaving all of New England. New England is extremely worried in this period that and it's where you get so many of these early histories that emphasize the pilgrims and, the you know, the John Winthrop's and the city on the hill, New England is worried about its place in American history. It felt like they were the, the vital force at the beginning, but they feel very much like the West is gonna take away all its thunder. And so that, which is part of the thing that drives their desire to transplant New England culture and values. So uh, people are leaving all of the New England states. And of course, when the Connecticut's move up to Vermont, they find many of them find that's just not tenable. So they go up and out and there's, there's, I, I think it's hard for us to really grasp the mobility of people in a time when we think 
it was the good old days and everybody lived where they were born for all their lives, just not so. Yes. So in order to get to Ohio, they had to pass through New York or Pennsylvania. New York was building the Erie Canal. Uh, why did, did, did a lot of them stay there or on the way? The question is that in order to get to Ohio, they had to go through New York or Pennsylvania. I can be taught. <laughs> they had to go through New York or Pennsylvania. New York is building the Erie Canal. Did people stay along the way? And absolutely they did. The, this chain of letters I'm talking about, one of the links in that chain was Utica, New York, which was one of the first out migration places. And of course, I, I talked in my talk about people running into people from Connecticut all along the way west. So people are stopping for various, re, you know, for an infinite number of reasons all along the way. It seems clear that there are more Connecticut's deciding to stop along what becomes the canal route, the northern route, than along the southern route through Pennsylvania. That's probably because Pennsylvania was, you know, more settled and it was more contested. Let's take the internet question. Yes. Uh, so you talked a lot about, you know, alias Vermont. Um, so Melanie is asking, do you know approximately how many of those Vermont towns were settled largely by Connecticut versus the New Hampshire and Massachusetts migrants? She's asking because uh, New Hampshire and New York fought over the Vermont territory quite a bit. The very good question, the, the, which I don't know the answer to, but I'll repeat <laughs> Melanie's question, which is the, the people of Vermont wanted to call it alias Vermont, but there had been battles between New York and Massachusetts over the Vermont land. So how many New Yorkers and Massachusettsians? <laughs> That's worse than Connecticut's. I mean, what do you call it? <laughs> people from Massachusetts were migrating into Vermont. And the answer is a lot of them, and it was very contested. And I'm thinking out loud, but that may be why they kind of settled on the, we'll call it New Connecticut, because there was so much uh, dissension between the New York and Vermont name. Uh, the, I think the implication of your question was, were there more Connecticut towns than New York or Massachusetts towns? I don't know, but I do know that when they decided to name uh, Vermont, the name they chose was New Connecticut, not the other two. Perhaps somewhere they recorded the reasons. Yes. Were tradespeople and professionals like lawyers and doctors attracted in the same numbers or relatively so as farmers? Were tradespeople, doctors and lawyers attracted in the same numbers as farmers and lawyers? Excellent question. I have no idea. So that one that one warrants research. My hunch is for some people, they saw that as great political opportunity for them. For others, if they had a really good situation here, maybe not so much. And is that the basis, those people, were they the basis for the formation of towns? I, you know- The rest were farmers living in cabins in the countryside? I, it seems that there is always I'm, I'm going to I'm going to use a gender term. I don't mean it well in the time it actually applies. There's always a big man or others involved in town founding. There's somebody who becomes the leader in leader or leaders in these towns. I don't know if that's luck of the draw or designed into it. I just I just I don't know enough about how individual towns establish their town governments to know, but. I don't think, I would be surprised if there were places where just a bunch of ordinary people got together and said, I know, let's make a government. You know, it had to be somebody who would show up and say, well, you know, I was first selectman back in <laughs> Litchfield. I know how this works. So at least I would have said that. One more from the internet. Uh, sure. Uh, so we have uh, Peggy Knox is asking, uh, where can you find some of these letters and journals? Um, you know, how accessible is the information that you base your research on? The information that I base my research on is as actually the, the chain of letters that I talked about is from a private collection, but it's not unique. 
There are wonderful collections, many of them in the Litchfield Historical Society in Litchfield, <laughs> Connecticut. Linda Arnold is the curator and you, you're not the, pardon me? Linda Why did I say Arnold? I, it's one of those days. <laughs> Linda Hocking is the curator. If she's not there, ask for Linda Arnold and they'll say, oh, yeah. <laughs> excuse me, Linda. Uh, there are wonder, the, the number of letters is phenomenal because so many people went and so many people communicated. And this was a literate society. I don't know what's gonna happen you know, a hundred years from now, how are we gonna record day-to-day -day life in the sea of junk emails that we keep? I, uh, they'll find a way, but I don't know what it's gonna be. But this is a wonderful place to come to begin your research, the Connecticut Historical Society, your local historical society. You go anywhere, there's a collection of letters from 1800 to 1850, and you will find meaningful letters about out-migration and communication to the West because it was such an important part of people's <clears throat> lives. So. One more, Mr. Yeah. Horvath. I have, I have one question, uh, and that is, uh, uh, are you aware that one of Whitfield's brothers, one of the most famous immigrants of Vermont, is taught by the name of Ben Allen? The question is, <laughs> am I familiar <clears throat> that one of Litchfield's <laughs> most famous residents was one of Vermont's most famous residents. I think it's all becoming clear now <laughs> that, that Ethan Allen and his brother Ira were, they just said Vermont is where we're gonna make our fortune. And they became huge land speculators in Vermont. And now that you mention it, I bet if, you went and looked pretty close. That decision to call Vermont New Connecticut probably has a signature, Ethan and Ira Allen connected to it somewhere. Thank you very much. That's great. That, by the way, is more copies than it's ever sold. So, I, you know, I, I expect that table to remain full. Um, and I think it's the election cake recipe. The election cake recipe is. is a, book, uh, a recipe for an election cake from the 19th century, and we have two of them for you to try in our reception. Also, some cheese and crackers and some wine and water and whatever else we can, we can give you. So, um, thank you very much for being here. Thank you all. And thank Adios. you. And could we, could we thank all of the Zoom people for their patience? Wonderful. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, everyone be well, get back to the rain. I'm sorry, it's gonna be sunny soon, bye. <laughs>